Um, so, um, I, I was delighted to hear that there's some uh, uh, members from psychiatry, uh, nursing, allied professionals, as well as geriatricians and general practitioners. And, and again, you know, neurovascular disease, um, it's the third commonest cause of mortality in the Western world. It's the greatest cause of disability. Unfortunately, somebody suffers a neurovascular event every five minutes in the UK. And, and, and you know, uh, the chances of having a stroke um, in your lifetime are at 20 to 25%. And of course, four out of five strokes are asymptomatic. So when we see patients, um, we don't often just see the, the, the ictal event that has actually presented them to hospital. We actually look at their scans and think, well, you probably have had uh, events in the past. So most neurovascular events are asymptomatic. Um, if we think about, uh, and I'm going to talk about ischemic strokes, which is, of course, 80% of strokes as opposed to uh, cerebral hemorrhages or extra axial dural bleeds, 80% uh, of strokes are a blockage of a vessel. And of course, so what happens is you have a, a core of infarctive tissue, and then you have an area around the brain which is presenting with symptoms, but potentially, potentially is amenable to recanalization therapy, and that's clot busting treatment. And we, when we call this the ischemic penumbra, um, and this is the area around the outside. And I think this is important, um, regardless of the, the pathology of what's caused the blockage of the vessel, there's often a, an area of tissue which is actually uh, potentially salvageable. So um, this is a patient, so this is an angiogram, this is not a patient, this is an angiogram of a patient who can't speak, who um, has got right arm, right leg weakness. And you can see in your uh, left hand, uh, picture that uh, this is the internal carotid artery coming up, this is the anterior cerebral artery here, and of course there's a lack of flow within the left middle cerebral artery. And after successful um, use of TPA, the vessel opens and the patient is able to speak and move their right arm and leg. And this is really the big change in neurovascular medicine that we've seen over the last few years. Rather embarrassingly, and those of you who've been following the commentary in the BMJ, uh, I mean, we've known about TPA for the last, since 1995, the first NIN study. And unfortunately, there are still a few centres in the UK that don't offer 24-hour TPA service, which I think is a great embarrassment for those of us who work in neurovascular medicine and also the policy makers. But there's no doubt this treatment does work. I'm quite happy to take questions afterwards or at coffee if you are in any doubt uh, from some of my A&E colleagues regarding whether it works. OK, so... Um, with, a, with an ischemic stroke, uh, what are the main causes? So we're going to exclude the minority, which are the rarer causes of vascular disease and the pro-coagulable states. And we'll talk about uh, small vessel disease, the atherosclerosis that occurs in all vessels, but also in the carotid arteries, and also those uh, clots that form either in the left ventricle, but also in the left atrium and usually the left atrial appendage, which then fly off and get caught in smaller vessels, cardioembolic strokes. And roughly, I think it's um, helpful to think of those three causes in thirds. Now, that may come as a shock to some of you who remember some of the original work, which suggested that cardioembolic strokes accounted for no more than a fifth, no more than a fifth of patients that had a neurovascular event. And for those of us who work in stroke medicine, we've known that our stroke units, unfortunately, are disproportionately populated with patients with atrial fibrillation. And so we felt for a while that it's at least a third, if not more. But unfortunately, the published data did not demonstrate that. Um, so there's 12 modifiable risk factors here for all ischemic strokes. And I could probably spend half an hour on, out on each of these, but there isn't time. And uh, hopefully at some point, uh, I might get to come back and talk to you about obstructive sleep apnea in older people, because this is one of my interests. And I think it's very common. At least one in 10, I think of, uh, well, uh, we know of the adult population have a sleep disorder. And in older people, that might be one in eight. And so those patients that you find are sleeping during the day that may well have some cognitive impairment and some depression, does not mean they do not also have a sleep disorder as well. And I think the use of polysnorphy um, in older people is valid and can have a significant benefit. Um, uh, it's a risk factor for ischemic stroke and also card cardiovascular disease. But we're not here to talk about that, unfortunately. We're here to talk about atrial fibrillation. And I think uh, if we forget thrombolysis, if we forget 
uh, uh, intra-arterial clot retraction. If we think about prevention, there's no doubt the single most important factor across the United Kingdom for preventing disability and death in neurovascular disease is making sure patients with atrial fibrillation are anticoagulated. And if you take nothing else away from this uh, 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 talk today, it's you must have a really good reason not to be anticoagulating patients in atrial fibrillation. And that's either persistent or paroxysmal. And I think, unfortunately, it will take a few high-profile litigation cases before everybody decides they must be anticoagulated. Because I do think the evidence is overwhelming in favour of anticoagulation. And it doesn't matter which agent, it's about something other than aspirin and formal anticoagulation. OK, so um, how common is atrial fibrillation? Well, we know as the population ages, we know that the incidence increases. To those patients over 80, about 1 in 10 patients will have either persistent or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And we know if we take the average general practice that there'll be two or three new cases of paroxysmal persistent atrial fibrillation found per year. And of course, that's on the background of up to 25 patients that are known about within your data set. Now, whether as general practitioners you're aware of those patients or not is a different matter. And of course, that's where the NHS improvement GRASP AF tool uh, comes into its own because of course, uh, the idea was of course to interrogate databases to see those patients with palpitations on warfarin, those patients who had the words AF in, the, in their history, whether they were um, or had been appropriately risk assessed and if appropriate, offered anticoagulation. Um, why is it so important? Because there's a causal relationship between atrial fibrillation and neurovascular disease stroke. We know that there's at least a five-fold fold increase in the likelihood of suffering a stroke if you have atrial fibrillation, we know you tend to do worse. If we think about good stroke units in the country with um, a 30-day mortality approaching 8%, uh, if you have an AF-induced stroke, that's up to 25%. We know that of those people who survive, half are disabled. Now, why is that? And there's many biological plausible mechanisms of why patients with AF-induced strokes do worse. But I think the most credible, um, and if you think about a blockage of a major artery, it's really the collaterals and your autoregulation within the brain which determine whether or not, or how much and what volume of tissue dies. And of course, if you have a relative paucity of atherosclerosis and uh, small vessel disease, but you suddenly have a major blockage of one of the arteries, and of course the collaterals have not developed, and therefore you tend to have a wider and larger infarct. Um, so how are we doing uh, uh, across the country? Um, what I'm going to present now is some new data, publicly available to you all, but it's from coded data, and this is, uh, and there'll be a paper coming out shortly looking at this, and this really does emphasise just how common atrial fibrillation associated with ischemic stroke is in the UK. So again, those figures that uh, I was always taught during my stroke fellowship training uh, and at medical school of one in fifth of patients having atrial fibrillation, the reality is taking from coded data in the primary position that almost 40% of patients with an ischemic stroke have atrial fibrillation co-coded. Now that may even be an underestimation because of course we all know that coded data might not be as accurate as one would like. Um, so, uh, now, you, import, importantly, it seems to be going down, but it's still almost 40%. Now, what's your chances of dying in hospital with uh, uh, atrial fibrillation associated ischemic stroke? And again, I said a good unit, 8 to 10% mortality, um, it's almost 20%. As we would like to think since 2009, it's decreasing, which is all excellent news and, of course, is what we see across the country. What does that equate to when it comes to actually the um, uh, patients uh, on stroke units? Well, almost a half of all patients, or bed days rather, half of all bed days are occupied by those patients who've got an AF-associated stroke. They tend to be, uh, have greater functional disability. And of course, what does that mean for the uh, uh, financiers? Well, of course, um, it means that significant cost. And I think it is important for those who are involved in commissioning and particularly in relationship to the newer drugs, which are possibly two or three times as expensive, um, uh, including the anticoagulant monitoring uh, costs, that about £120 million per year is the cost of AF-induced stroke. So it's huge.